This is the Specialized Epic World Cup, and this is the Trek Supercaliber. Rob and I have put these to the test to find out which is the best. We've said it before and we'll say it again, cross country is in the midst of a resurgence. 2023 saw two of the biggest brands in XC, Specialized and Trek, release or update versions of their short travel XC rippers, the Specialized Epic World Cup and the Trek Supercaliber. The burning questions everyone wants answers to are, are these sub 100 mm XC race bikes actually any good? And can they really replace the trusty cross country hardtail for good? To find out, Rob and I have been giving it the beans on these two bikes. I've been lapping the 75mm Travel Epic World Cup, while Rob has been rallying the 80mm Travel Super Caliber. We've both then jumped on each other's bikes for a quick lap too. Right Tom, let's quickly go through their frame spec and then kit selections, and then take them both for a lap. But first, don't forget to subscribe for more head-to-head -head reviews like this one. So the Epic World Cup is brand new this year and I've got the top spec S-Works version. This uses their fancy FACT 12M carbon. The frame's 75mm to travel is controlled by a custom-built RockShox Sidlux WCID shock, which is driven by a small linkage just under the top tube to give the chassis a touch more stiffness. Further forward, internal cable routing and sleek-looking headset-routed hoses keep the bike looking fast. Two sets of bottom mounts ensure that you can get all of your hydration in there too. Trek's frame set is just as fancy as Tom's S-Works offering. The SLR frame seen here is said to be lighter than the SL version that Trek also offer thanks to the lack of internal guide tubes and the higher modulus carbon fibre used. Again, there's a custom shock to deliver the 80mm of travel. Trek have collaborated with RockShox to create the new Isostrut shock which uses the Sidlux internals. With the extended seat stays wrapping around and sliding over the shock, the shock becomes a structural part of the frame. There's less traditional shock hardware, fewer pivots and links, which makes for a stiffer overall connection between the front and rear triangles, plus a lower weight. The chain stays wrap around the seat tube in front of the main pivot in a bid to further boost stiffness. Again, you can easily get a pair of bottles inside the front triangle of the frame. All right then, those are the details, but let's quickly compare some numbers. The Epic's head angle is a degree slacker than the Trek's at 66 degrees and the reach is 5mm longer at 445mm in a medium. They have the same 74.5 degree seat angle, but the Epic's bottom bracket is a few mil lower. When it comes to weight, these two bikes both weigh exactly the same, 9.6 kilograms. but bear in mind that my test bike is a large and Rob's is a medium, so mine takes the title. But wait aside, which bike takes the win when it comes to geometry? It's a tough call, but worth remembering that the Trek has an extra five millimeters of travel. So with SAG, both bikes are gonna feel similar. It's a close one, but I reckon the Trek nabs it at the line here. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. Let's dive into the suspension a little bit here. My Trek might have a little extra travel on tap, but it is only five mil. You set it up more like a regular bike with up to 35% sag. Check out Will's video on exactly how to set up your own sag, but not until you find out the winner at the end of this video. Trek designed the Supercaliber to offer the pedal efficiency of a hardtail, but give you enough cushioning to handle the impacts and compressions around a modern XC course. When you want to firm it up, there's a two position lockout that makes the shock and fork nice and stiff. Specialized have a different approach with their 75mm travel suspension. There's no lockout here, but instead three negative air spring volume options. No gulp, half gulp and full gulp, which offer between 0 and 10% sag. There's my gulp. When it's in the no gulp or 0% sag setting, there's no air in the negative spring and the bike's designed to feel just like a hardtail until you hit something big. But by depressing the negative air spring valve on the side of the shock, you can introduce some air into it, giving it 5 or 10% sag. It's still less sag than the Trek, but it gives you a slightly softened ride. In the fork, there's Spech's long-running brain damper, where an adjustable inertia valve provides a mechanical platform separating pedal bob from bump absorption. So, is there a winner here? It's probably too early to tell, but the proof is in the riding, which we'll go on to shortly. Let's call it a draw for now. We're not going to spend too long talking about the kit, as truth be told, it's all very similar. 
Both bikes feature a 110mm travel RockShox SID SL fork, one of the lightest race-ready forks on the market. They both have SRAM's XXSL transmission drivetrains, own brand carbon hoops and lightweight tyres. Though it's worth noting that I switched the 2.2 inch Bontrager tyre for some wider 2.4 inch numbers in the same tread pattern and construction. My bike has the four piston SRAM level ultimate stealth brakes that are actually lighter than your less powerful two piston versions, at least if SRAM's claim weights can be believed. Okay then, but I think my bike wins out here and I'll tell you why in just a moment. First though, both bikes have integrated bar and stem cockpits, which means no rider adjustment. However, Rob's a lucky boy with his Fox Transfer SL dropper post. I'm fast and light with a rigid carbon post. But here's why I reckon I win this round just about. My tires are 2.4 inches wide from the off, while Rob's were a skinny 2.2, and my chain set comes with a power meter, while Rob will just have to guess how much effort he's putting in. Okay, everyone, that's the specs out of the way. But what's really important is how the bikes ride. Out of the gate, the Super Calibre feels taut. When you're sprinting, the rear end stays solid with virtually no movement at all. At the same time, despite some seriously skinny tread, the St. Anne tyres do seem to grip on hard pack or fine gravelly terrain really well. It's the same with the Epic, but I have to say in the no gulp or zero sag setting, the bike really does feel like a hardtail under power. There is zero give. This does leave the rear Renegade tyre scrabbling for grip on looser surfaces, so it was really interesting to feel the difference a hint of sag makes. Suddenly the tyre's grip is boosted, while the frame still feels seriously tight. Okay, so maybe we give the sprint title to the Spech. It seems you can have your cake and eat it. While the Trek surges forward under power, it can't quite match how solid the Spech's hardtail-esque power transfer when you're really gunning it. I've used the Epic in no, half and full gulp modes, and I have to say this is the best climbing bike I've ever ridden. With no sag, it's as reactive as a hardtail. On smooth, punchy climbs, its reactions to pedal inputs is instant. You can really give it full gas without any mushy feelings, but beware of sleepy surfaces as it'll catch you out. Add in some sag and you still get that reactivity, but it's tempered with a slight hint of movement. All that does though is boost grip levels you'd never imagine the Renegade can give. Honestly, on steep technical climbs, this bike is a mountain goat. The Trek settles deeper into its travel than the Spech, but while pedalling, there's masses of support and a super stable platform that barely moves when you're spinning the cranks. This makes the Super Calibre feel sprightly and eager to claw its way up just about any incline going. However, when you do encounter a rock step or route, the rear wheel can still move freely enough to take the edge off the impact, boost in traction and keep you feeling in control as you continue to power up the hill. One thing I would prefer would be that if the fork damper would offer three rather than just two positions. An open pedal and lock position would be better for me just so I could further fine tune the fork feel. Rob, I'm not sure who's gonna take the win here. I love having the hardtail feeling through the frame on smoother tracks. And when it's techie, the five or 10% sag makes a real difference. Makes it feel much more like the super calf. Best of both worlds. Very true, mate, but if you want to change how the back end feels, you've got to stop, pull out a shock pump, and press a valve. Hardly something you're going to do mid-race. On the other hand, Trek's two-position lockout means I can have both options at the twist of my wrist. I think I'm going to take the win here. Right, what goes up must go down, so let's compare descending performances. Now on paper, Geometry and tyres are probably better on your bike, Tom. Yeah, my head angle is slacker, my reach is a little bit longer, and the bottom bracket is lower. None of these things I'm going to complain about. However, with much less sag than your bike at the back, all my angles steepen a touch when I weight the bike as the fork compresses. Yours acts more like a normal full suss bike with both ends sagging, which perhaps maintains geometry a little more. Yeah, the Supercal suspension, as it is, has more of a traditional feel. With the dropper seat post, the ride position when up out of the saddle is more centered too, making for a more controlled and confident stance on the bike. The rear suspension is there to soak up and quell impacts rather than to totally absorb them in a buttery smooth fashion. That means I feel more trail feedback through the chassis, but thankfully there's enough give, balance and progression to allow me to make the most of the 80 millimeters of travel on tap. 
The bigger four piston calipers on the Super Caliber help when descending too, especially in treacherous conditions. My Epic still descends really well, especially for such a short travel bike, largely thanks to the shape and the tyres, which I'm starting to love. With less sag, you sit higher in the travel, but it means there's plenty there to deal with bangs and wallops. It does have a bit of a trapdoor feel though, especially in the 0 and 5% sag settings. Basically, it feels like a hardtail until the moment it doesn't, at which point it drops quickly into its travel. It's firing over repeated hits, but that first hit can feel a little awkward. I'd say that in the zero sag setting, it's like a turbocharged hardtail. You're whizzing along and instead of backing off as soon as you see some tech, you know you don't have to back off quite as much. In the more sagged settings, it almost feels like a full suspension bike. However, like your Trek, I think it's more of a case of taking the edge off things rather than flattering your descending skills. I think the Trek has to take top honours here. My suspension feels a little more normal than yours and those bigger brakes help when things get scary. I'll admit the wider 2.4 inch tyres did make a massive difference when it came to descending. Right, closing thoughts then? The Super Cow is arguably more of an all-rounder thanks to how that 80mm of rear wheel travel is delivered. There's no denying just how formidable this machine is when you get on the gas though. Put the power down and the Super Calibre surges forward at breakneck speed, but there's enough squish to soften impacts enough to boost comfort levels on longer rides too. And it helps massively that it comes with a dropper seat post, which elevates control further. Overall, the Epic World Cup is, to all intents and purposes, a really niche bike. Short course XC racers who love tasting blood and putting in 100% effort in every lap will love its tenacious attitude to speed. However, marathon racers might benefit from more travel to make long days and prolonged descents a little more palatable. Likewise, this isn't a bike that's up for a cruisy ride. You'll just find yourself egged on at every opportunity, returning a husk of a human being every time you go out. As a final point, I think we both agree that the combined bar and stem cockpits aren't to our tastes. Yeah, mine had too much back suite for my taste, was a touch narrow and really harsh. I think yours was too. Yeah, I must admit I'm not a massive fan, sorry. Right, so I think we're all done here. Scores on the doors, it feels like the Trek just edges the special over the line, but it was a real sprint to the finish. It feels more like a regular bike while still having a real racing attitude, but it's just a touch more versatile. 100%. I loved riding the Epic World Cup, but it's just a little bit too niche to be a real contender. And with that, we're done. Full reviews and a head-to-head -head feature are going in MBUK Magazine 430 and on Bike Radar right about now. Thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to see more XC content, how's about this video? <laughs> and go!